My name is Kent Whitworth, and it's my privilege to serve as the Executive Director of the Kentucky Historical Society, and it's an honor to have all of you with us this evening. The, uh, this symposium and the keynote are a part of a series of KHS programs to commemorate Kentucky Statehood and Kentucky Statehood Month in this particular year. As many of you probably already know, 2017 is somewhat of a milestone in the Commonwealth's history. Uh, surely you noticed the subtle banners out front with three big numbers, 225. I've, I've got, gotten a lot of ribbing from my colleagues about those. So. But we are uh, having a lot of fun and, and, and listening intently to uh, our fellow Kentuckians around the state for the entire year. Uh, but during this month, we've got a series of programs. This is the second, and there are a few more coming up. Actually, it's the third. Um, there's another program on June 24th, uh, the Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall event that I hope you'll join us for. But frankly, I can't think of a more strategic time uh, to discuss the role of digital history in society uh, and in the academy, both in Kentucky and nationally. So we are thrilled not only to have Dr. Ayers with us, um, but uh, for him to talk about this particular topic. And I, like very many people, uh, have been an admirer, a fan, if you will, of Dr. Ayers uh, for years. I, I uh, stalked him on C-SPAN um, and feel like I know him quite well, and he's so gracious that as I met him for the first time in person this afternoon, and we just picked up where we had left off. But, and so it was really great. It is a, a real honor to have you with us. And, um, we thank you also, I personally want to thank you for your support of the History Relevance Campaign. That is an initiative that is near and dear to my heart, and I know just uh, this spring in New Orleans you helped fly that uh, flag, and we're grateful. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Patrick Lewis for his vision and his leadership of the Civil War Governors of Kentucky and this symposium. He and Tony Curtis and Whitney Smith have been exemplary stewards of the Civil War Governors of Kentucky Project, and I cannot thank all three of them enough. Also want to say a special thanks to Dr. David Turpey, the editor of the Kentucky Historical Society Register, uh, Dr. Mandy Higgins, uh, our community engagement administrator, and certainly our director of research experience, Louise Jones. Uh, they have all done excellent work on, on this symposium and this evening. We wanted to keep this symposium intimate, uh, particularly the, the keynote. Um, nevertheless, there was a, a range of people, scholars, educators, people who manage collections and, and exhibition program developers, public policy makers, uh, board leaders, and I think we've got representatives from all those perspectives in the room tonight. And we look forward to you all engaging in, in what I think will probably break that into a conversation at some point. Um, I, I would also uh, like to say a special word of thanks uh, to our current and former board members. If you are a member of the KHS Governing Board, a member of the KHS Foundation Board, or the Kentucky Oral History Commission, uh, presently or in the past, would you please stand so we can recognize and thank you. Great to have all of you with us. I, we were expecting a few members of the General Assembly. I think Representative Graham and Representative Miller were um, planning to come. They may slip in a little bit later. Or, or Jerry or Derek here, I wanted to say thank you. Um, well, maybe we'll get a chance to recognize them a little bit later. Uh, this symposium and the keynote are, are possible in large part uh, due to the generosity of Dr. Lowell and Elaine M. Harrison, and, and frankly, their estate. And joining us this evening from Owensboro are three members of the Harrison's family, Nancy Bernard, uh, Laura Ship, and Ella Ship. I wondered if the three of you would stand so we could recognize you all, and thank you for your family. <laughs> I have asked a dear friend uh, and a very gifted scholar, editor, administrator, we could go on and on, a former uh, member of the governing board and an officer, uh, John Cleaver, uh, to come and pay tribute to Dr. and Mrs. Harrison. John? Ready? All right. Thank you, Kent. Uh, I am honored to uh, be asked to pay a tribute to Dr. Lowell Harrison. 
Early in 1988, I received a telephone call from Dr. Thomas D. Clark, and he asked if I would be interested in editing an Encyclopedia of Kentucky. It would commemorate the bicentennial of statehood in the year 1992. In a very weak moment, I accepted <laughs> and immediately regretted because I knew very little about Kentucky history. So I called upon three men to help me, men who served as my associate editors, Thomas Clark, James Clotter, and yes, Lowell Harrison. They are the dynamic trio, or I call them my holy trinity, <laughs> and I relied upon them constantly. I knew Dr. Harrison because I had contributed a chapter to his excellent book on the governors of Kentucky. His first advice came from that experience. He said, make sure all the writers return their work on time. <laughs> Since I had more than 450 writers, this good advice was a matter of no little concern. But we got it done. And on June the 1st of 1992, I sat in the old Capitol building with the three other editors and for five hours, we signed hundreds of copies. In fact, we were nearly late for our reception at the mansion and the encyclopedia sold out in two days. People were so desperate to get it that they contacted the university press and said, I'll give you two Garth Brooks tickets if you'll give me one encyclopedia. <laughs> and one man said, my wife is going to divorce me if you don't give me an encyclopedia. 5,000 copies in two days. And I attribute much of that to these three editors with whom I worked. In the ensuing months, we occasionally came together for other book signings. And on each occasion, I grew closer to and fonder of Lowell as a wonderful human being. In time, I thought of him not just as a colleague, but as a friend. It was then that I came to know Penny, his wife, and realized what a great helpmate she was to Lowell. Lowell's many contributions to the Kentucky Encyclopedia were but a very small part of his scholarship. If one wanted to know about Kentucky's road to statehood, its role in the Civil War, its native son Abraham Lincoln, the lives of John Breckinridge and George Rogers Clark, or his beloved teaching institution, Western Kentucky University, then one needed to look no further than to Lowell Harrison's works. And when the new history of Kentucky was published, it rightly carried the names of James Clotter and Lowell Harrison. I recall the words of Ben Johnson when referring to a writer he admired. Thou art a monument without a tomb and art still alive while thy book doth live and we have wits to read and praise to give. Today's paucity of Kentucky historians make his book all the more praiseworthy. But Lowell was more than a scholar. He was also a great teacher. Thousands of students were enriched and benefited from his cogent, insightful lectures filled with erudition and great humor. And last but not least, Lowell was a gentleman of the old school. I think he always wore a suit. I don't know if I ever saw Lowell without a suit coat and tie. He was a soft-spoken man with a bit of southern accent. He was gracious in manner and charming in speech. Lowell Harrison was a kind man. That was shown in his undying love for Penny, and he cared for her in later years. And he loved his entire family. Every time I was around Lowell, I reveled in his infectious spirit and his love of life and they never diminished. When I last saw him, he was living in assisted living in Owensboro. And Kent and Russell and I went down there to give him an award from the Kentucky Historical Society. He was sitting in a wheelchair, and we had a great visit. And when I left, I bent over and I hugged him, and I thanked him for his friendship and good memories, and told him that I loved him. 
He had given me much, and I wanted him to know that. But more than that, he gave our state much. And tonight, with this lecture, Lowell and Penny continue to give of themselves. I think if Lowell were here tonight, he would be embarrassed by this attention. He was a humble man. But to be embarrassed by greatness is a thing to which we should all aspire. And that was Lowell Harrison, great scholar, great teacher, great gentleman, and really great husband. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to turn this evening's program over to uh, Dr. Patrick Lewis, not only a rising star at the Kentucky Historical Society, but uh, impacting our profession nationally. And I'm just super proud to call him a friend and colleague. And I thank you, um, Patrick, for what you and uh, your colleagues in this project are doing, again, not just for KHS, but for the field. So Patrick. My thanks first to, to Kent and Dr. Kleber uh, for their remarks and, and also uh, to the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lectureship Program for allowing us to bring Dr. Ayers here tonight. As Kentucky celebrates its 225th birthday this month, I've been giving a lot of thought to lineage and legacy. Kentucky, of course, was the child of Virginia 225 years ago, the firstborn of the new union, as they said at the time. In two decades, Kentucky would itself give birth to the American West in Indiana, Missouri, and as a lanky young rail-splitting lawyer from Hodgenville would remind us, Illinois. <laughs> Family trees connect Kentuckians of all descriptions back to home and place as they have gone off to face uncertain futures against their will or look ambitiously to improve their fortunes in faraway places. And without Kentuckians particular concern about bloodlines, the Commonwealth would never have become the epicenter of the global thoroughbred industry. <laughs> History, as a practice and a profession, has family trees too. Historians' legacies take the form of graduate mentoring and advising relationships, which shape not only the research that their students undertake, but also model the commitment to teaching and public service that transforms a good scholar into an exceptional one. They take the form of books and research projects whose structure and ideas spark innovation and activity wherever their pages, paper or digital, reach across the globe. They take the form of commitment to broad public access to history and the humanities, making the past accessible to everyday Americans who may not be able to sit down in university classrooms, but who can explore the historical roots of their present and their future through their radio speakers and earbuds. In all of these ways, our guest tonight has led his generation of historians. In fact, as the current president of the Organization of American Historians, he sets the bar for the range of impacts that we as history professionals should strive to achieve. It is particularly important that Dr. Ayers be here this week as KHS welcomes leading historians from across the country and across the globe to draft a new chapter in our history of the Civil War era from a born digital project. The Civil War Governors of Kentucky Project and this gathering are the intellectual legacy of Dr. Ayers' Valley of the Shadow, which showed us all how to tell national stories through local people, how to harness new technology to allow all Americans to learn from their shared past, how to involve emerging historians in the development and production of such a site, and how to write about history with the elusive combination of accessibility and insight. Please join me then in welcoming the author and editor of over 10 books, Beverages, Beverage and Bancroft Prize winner, 2013 National Humanities Medal awardee, President Emeritus and Tucker Boatwright Professor of the Humanities at the University of Richmond, Dr. Edward Ayers. Good evening, everybody. I'll give you the highest praise my family knows. You all are so nice. It's just amazing, uh, and the, the feel, uh, the, the sense of camaraderie and common purpose and spirit that's animated uh, all day, and to see what animates this wonderful place, I'm really honored to be here. Any moment. Yeah. So I've been assigned tonight to talk about two things. The way digital history might expand scholarly research, and the ways that it might deepen public discourse. 
Now, I've had exciting conversations last night and all day with people who may and the people who have used the Civil War Governors of Kentucky archive, and I've been frantically revising my talk all day as people keep saying things that I wish that I had thought of and are stealing myself. And so I thought that what I would actually like to do is to try to give you some glimpses of ways that for 25 years I've been struggling to see what we might be able to do with digital history. Now I find today that students have a hard time imagining a time when history wasn't digital. I don't know how we went from a time when people couldn't imagine that it was possible to, well of course everything is online. And they think research is actually going online. And those of us who've been doing this for just a few years can remember uh, this had to be invented by somebody and it was not just a sort of a natural outgrowth. You know, so today our books are born from digital sources, written on digital machines, and turned into books with digital processes, and then distributed through digital networks, both paper versions and digital and audio versions. And yet somehow we keep saying, well, when is digital history going to arrive? We live in a time that's completely saturated by this, but we all wonder, where might this be heading? So the digital transition's gone faster, in some ways than we thought possible, and far slower and far more incompletely in others than it might seem in retrospect. And I believe that the project going on here today points the direction that we all need to be following from here on, but I'll, I'll get to that. Now, in some ways, the change began earlier than we usually start the story. If we imagine all of these developments as a revolution in access, in making available to people the primary sources on which all history is made. It's their dissemination. I think we might say that it began before computers and with the turn to microfilm in the 1930s. I think it also begins with places like the birth of the Kentucky Historical Society, which is bringing things together, saving them, taking them out of old attics and boxes. And so if you don't have that, nothing else matters. But uh, I kind of come into the story with this microfilm thing, and I, I think microfilm changed my life. Now, there's not a sentence that you hear every day, but it's the, it's the case. And libraries pioneered in microfilm in the years right after World War II, filming and archiving and distributing millions of pages of microfilm of newspapers and manuscript censuses and government records and private papers. And I made it all the way to graduate school without having any idea that I wanted to be a historian. And I thought I might be an English professor and half my coursework in graduate school even was in literary studies. But for some reason, one day I went into the microform room and looked at a newspaper from the 19th century. And suddenly the scales fell from my eyes and I made several, had several revelations that will not be news to you. A, this stuff actually happened. It wasn't just in a book. I, when I told my mom, a fifth grade teacher, I was going to go to graduate school in history, she said, well, what for, honey? We already know what happened, um, <laughs> which is a good point. But it turns out we don't. I devoted the last 25 years to showing no mom. We don't. But I'd never understood that it actually did happen and that people didn't know how it was going to turn out. And all this stuff was happening at the same time. And it was only through, and I see people nodding. I, I encourage this at any point in the evening where I say anything with which you agree, I, I like that very much. And from then I thought, you know, I think I would actually love to try to convey this sense of excitement and of actually touching the past to doing it myself. Not everybody's gonna have a chance to sit down with the wonderful experience of sitting in front of a big World War II era machine and reading scratchy images on microfilm. Not everybody's gonna have that magic. Um, and so from then on, in many ways, this whole idea of trying to include all the people who were in those newspapers, all the people who were in the mayor's court records, all the people who were in the ads for being bought and sold as enslaved people, all the people who were on the front page, but all the people then who were merchants in the back. I'm here in the Thomas D. Clark uh, room. Uh, huge impact on me, pills, petticoats, and plows. Um, if you've read that and then read things that I've written later, you'd see he stole every idea I ever had from Thomas Clark. So <laughs> it, it's nice to, to be here. But, and matter of fact, this, the book that I wrote that was most influenced by that, a book called Promise of the New South, 
The big breakthrough came when I persuaded my wife that if I was going to spend more time with her and the kids, which I assumed that she wanted, I'm not sure, but I just assumed she did, <laughs> that I was going to bring home a microfilm machine that I think I'm going to see if I could talk the library into loaning me so that I could work on evenings and weekends and do all that. And then just as important to persuade the librarians that I would bring back these reels of interlibrary loan microfilm that we were bringing from all over the country. Really, I'd bring them back. Um, and I would sit there and read thousands of pages of newspapers looking for just that one quote that conveyed that sense of what this place was like. It's all because of microfilm. And I thought, hey, I'd love to share that magic with my students. And so I tortured years, years, thousands of students by sending them to the same machines and saying, here, read a year of a southern newspaper and write a paper about it. That's the entire assignment. And all these pre-med students at the University of Virginia just completely freaked out. <laughs> but, but what's the question? I don't know. You tell me. And they would come back and they, and they, in the course evaluation, say, I don't really like errors very much, but that actually seeing the past raw was really pretty cool. So I kept doing that. So the big revolution for me came when I discovered kind of by accident uh, around 1991 that these microfilm newspapers and other microfilm records could actually be turned into something that you could read on a computer screen. Now that sounds like, duh, but it was really, the idea that you could see a picture on a computer screen at that time was remarkable, and that you could have enough horsepower to actually be able to distribute those images. These are the days before PDF files existed, <laughs> and so you'd have to write software to show what these images were. You had to find somebody who could turn these microfilm images into digital images. Group 4 com fax compression TIFFs, oh, I still remember it. And, but then also, what if you could show diaries and letters and the manuscript census? What if you could put all those in a way that people didn't have to be at a research library and didn't even have to know they existed, but would be able to have that same experience of seeing the past unmediated? So that was the idea before it was actually quite possible uh, in 1991 and 1992. We started building it in something called SGML, which stood, we said, for sounds good, maybe later. Um, <laughs> but that turned out to be the mother of HTML, which is what the World Wide Web is based on. And with the great foresight that comes from being profoundly lucky, we were there at the beginning for just that reason. So, with the help of uh, two people who are here with us today, Ann Sarah Rubin and Amy Merle Taylor, uh, we figured out how to make those things accessible to people. And you heard from Patrick about the Valley of the Shadow, uh, and that's what this is. And the shortest version of this is every piece of information we could find about every person who lived in a northern community and southern community from John Brown's raid to the end of Reconstruction. Down at the bottom it says 1993 to 2007. And that's not actually a misprint. That that's how long it took to make this thing because we didn't actually have a collection. We just had this idea and went out and found all this stuff wherever we could in the Library of Congress to somebody's basement and gathered it all together. And basically what we did is we replicated the idea of an archive. And so that has all the different names of all the different things that are in there. So, that's pretty cool, and there's many, many things in there. We'll talk a little bit about it later. Uh, but but an, another tributary flowed into this because I was not only geeky in this way, but I was geeky in another way. Uh, that back in the 70s when I was in graduate school, historians had the idea for a very brief time that we might be able to use statistics to see patterns in the past. We call that time Thursday. Uh, because it, it, it came and went so quickly, but for a while we were white heat. We've unlocked the secrets of the American past. We're going to turn it into statistics. Yes, we're going to make regression analysis. And that was the response of everybody else at the time too, but it seemed too good at this. But it is a fact that it would be a good idea if we had some idea of proportion and scale. How many people 
did this or that? How much property did they have? So one of the things that we did was digitize all these tax records and you can search the census and you can go to the population census and the story that I tell is that my daughter walked in when we were building this one down. She says, hey daddy, what are you doing? And I kind of explained. She says, are there any 11 year old girls named Hannah in there? And there are. That's the kind of detail that we had. That's because people with young eyes and nimble fingers typed the entire manuscript, population, manufacturing, agricultural, and slaveholding census in for two places for two census years. Now, this is long before Ancestry.com, and I will point out other people, apparently, as my dad would point out, smarter than me, found out ways to make millions of dollars <laughs> by doing this. Whereas I get to give cool talks later that we could do all this. But what this would mean is you could see how many people had between $100 and $300 worth of property, what women possessed property, what the distribution of slaveholders was like, and all those kinds of things. So we made that cool, and that was kind of a statistical thing. So you have the very humane kind of thing of being able to read these letters and diaries, and also this other tributary that allowed you to do this. So what was amazing is that there were network computers in the early 1990s that could do this. And we got a grant of $100,000 from IBM. And with that money, we bought, I believe, eight, strap yourselves in, 17-inch color monitor, <laughs> color, uh, with one gig hard drives uh, attached to one server. Basically, you could go to Best Buy right now and buy that for $300, uh, and the, the salesperson would sneer at you for buying such a low-powered machine. But we thought that we had seen nirvana, that it was possible to do these things, because you could actually see an image of a newspaper on the screen. And so we had the idea, wouldn't it be great if high school kids all around the country didn't have to take their history from a shrink-wrapped textbook, fourth, fifth, sixth hand, we could actually figure things out for themselves. And the Valley of the Shadow doesn't tell you what to think about this. It doesn't give you the conclusions. It just says, here, what caused the Civil War? How different were Northerners and Southerners? How did enslaved people live in the injustice of slavery? How did white Southerners live by inflicting the injustice of slavery? What was the Civil War like? All these different things. So we built all this. Now, as it turns out, there's one more tributary that was flowing into all this that you're not expecting, and that's something called the hypertext. Now, the idea of inventing new forms of writing that would actually convey that sense that I had sitting in front of that microfilm machine of all these things weaving together, of history being between the lines, of history not being a, a bunch of things to memorize, but this unfolding story, wouldn't it be cool if there were ways to show some of that simultaneity, to show some of that interweaving. Now, as it turns out, the dream of inventing these things predated the computing network. So this is Vannevar Bush, who was a very important scientist in the United States. And in 1945, he wrote an important essay called As We May Think. And apparently involves having an eye implant in the middle of your forehead here, but that's actually what that was for. And here's the thing that I love. He invented the Mimex, which is this device right here. And what you can see is it's all based on microfilm. That you could weave together from different reels of microfilm on that screen there, that you were going to be able to see the images of the microfilm and compare it to another image of microfilm. And then you push one of the buttons on the side, and it would take a photograph of that and capture that link. So he envisioned the linkages of hypertext long before digital technologies invented. And where did it come from? Our friend, Microfilm. And this is in The Atlantic and Time Magazine. And the title of it, As We May Think. His idea is, you know, this is actually the way we all think. We think by association. We're not really linear thinkers. Wouldn't it be great if we built a machine that would capture some of that insight along the way. So the idea of all the web is built in HTML, hypertext markup language, and the idea was that it would allow you to branch. Now, the, the sad thing is, is that HTML is not as good as what Vannevar Bush invented, or imagined. He didn't actually make this thing. He just thought it up. Uh, because HTML just has you link from one thing to another. 
what you really want to do is be able to link to multiple things at once. But we dumbed it down actually to fit uh, onto the World Wide Web. Now I was fascinated with this idea that we might be able to write differently. Now I love history books as much as anybody, but I thought, wow, look what's happening to us in our own time. Suddenly we're presented with an entirely new technology that might allow us to write history in new ways. And so I, tr I tried it, uh, and uh, I'm guessing it's, is it this one? We'll find out. It is. So this claims to be the first native digital scholarly article, uh, American Historical Review, and it's got every piece of information that you would have uh, to make this article. It was on the cover of the American Historical Review, and it was in 2003, and here is everything about, you can see all different topics, agriculture, uh, communication, demography, education, and it's all about how a northern community and a southern community happen to differ. Uh, so we made this, and nobody else thought it was a good idea. That we were the first one, and we we're the last one. And I'm not kidding. I, I thought the idea of a hypertextual article would allow us, hey, if we believe that showing evidence is good, wouldn't it be if you could see it all? Isn't a footnote really just a broken hyperlink? Right? Wouldn't you actually like to see the image of the original document on when this is based? And, you know, so the reviewers um, said, yeah, you should publish this, uh, but I don't want to do it, and nobody else really much wanted to do it. So we had to do invent things like this, because there's not page numbers. Um, and so how would you know how much you'd read? Well, here the, the black dot turns red if you've looked at that page. So it's kind of hypertext, right? It doesn't tell you what to think in what order, but presents the array of things with which you might think. But it was a dead end. You know, sometimes in elegant uh, introductions such as the one Patrick gave, now people say I'm a pioneer. I said, no, a pioneer is somebody people follow. I'm just wandering around the woods, apparently, <laughs> since there's nobody doing that. In fact, as I said, the web actually kind of suppresses this. We're used to just looking in analog fashion at one thing and then the next thing, rather than branching out where it might be. So the fact is, after all of this, after the enormous investments of librarians and archivists, Library of Congress, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, investing in creating new forms of scholarship, we write exactly the same kind of books that we did 50 years ago. The monograph really hasn't changed. And monograph is a great technology. It does exactly what it has. And I thought, well, maybe that we could still keep the monograph and think about other ways as well. Now, I should say that I've contributed to this stasis because I had the Valley of the Shadow, and the whole idea was, hey, I think I'll write a book out of it. And when I wrote a book out of it, I wrote the most analog book I could possibly write. Matter of fact, I made it as much like a novel as I could. It does say at the beginning, oh, by the way, this is the first history book ever written in which you can see the entire archive on which it's based. And then I go on and ignore it all. And then, to make matters worse, last year, I wrote another book from it that completes the story. And with a 14-year lag in between, I was doing the dean and president thing, but, and then came back. And here's the good news. It still works. The Valley of the Shadow with millions of elements in it, hardwired together back in the very early days. The, the first version of this was written in WordPerfect. And the first demos I gave of it were uh, transparencies on an overhead projector, and I said, imagine if you will, you click on this, and this would come up. And that was in San Francisco in 1994. So, uh, and the fact, now, after we built it, uh, the University of Virginia, uh, when I left uh, to go to Richmond, actually said, okay, let's take it all apart and make sure this thing endures. And it hasn't been touched in five years, and it all still works, and I know, because I hit every single page of it to write this book I wrote. So the, the new book's called, uh, the Thin Light of Freedom, and it'll be, I, it'll be a, it's wonderful any holiday or gift occasions that you may have. <laughs> it'll be out this fall, and you can say, you know, I saw him give this talk about all this crazy digital stuff, but you're not supposed to notice it when you're reading the book. But it was impossible otherwise. We were talking today in our discussions about grounded history that the, that the, the Civil War governor's papers make possible. 
You know, we know how tall all the soldiers were from these two places. We know exactly what maladies they had. You know, we can link all these different kind of things in a hypertextual way. And so in the book, I just kind of weave a little bit of that in there because the, I'm just able to call it up, as Vannevar Bush might have dreamed, and said, oh, I remember, that's a great quote from her. Oh, look, she lived there and she was, you know, 47 years old, they owned six slaves, her son was fighting for the Fifth Virginia. I just find all that in a matter of a minute because it was all there. And then write a book in which everything is true but has a kind of command over the detail that you couldn't have because you can't keep all that in your head. You know, the fundamental problem is that humans can't tell two stories at the same time in our head. The computers can keep as many stories as you want in their head. So I think of it as like a, a big organ that you can just play. It's got all this in it. So whatever you think about my new book, it shows that this digital thing will still work, which is an important thing. The amount of work that goes into all of this is really boggling to think about. And we've wondered a lot of times, well, I put something in a manila folder and I put it in this library box, it's gonna be here in 100 years. If we're putting these things online, are they gonna be there? Are they gonna work? Are all these links gonna break? And it shows that if you have expert librarians who go back in and look at all these things and test every element of it, um, that they can work for five years and have millions of people look at them and cost nothing for the home institution to run it. It's a good investment. Some people say, well, you know, this costs so much. Well, not on a per user basis. If you prorate how much it costs for you know, a manuscript collection that 12 people might look at in a decade, comparing it to putting those same things in a digital environment in which you could have thousands of students looking at in a month, you can see that it's actually a good investment. So around the time that I finished the Valley of the Project, I left <laughs> uh, UVA for the University of Richmond. And there I said, you know, whew, okay, it looks like we finished that thing. And it, it, so that was a long time, and that was a lot of money to raise. And, you know, one reason I became Dean of Arts and Sciences is I, I traded my arm. You know, yes, I'll be Dean if you'll sustain this thing. You know, I didn't, didn't have that many arms and legs left, so it was a good thing we finished it up. But I thought, you know, Look how much things have changed between 1992 and 2007. Think of all the things that have been digitized now, and that was the year the iPhone was introduced as well. It was also the year that a lot of the social media were introduced. And I said, we can do things now that we could not even think about in 1992. I don't want to build an entire archive of primary sources that we have to gather and transcribe again. What I want to do is harvest a lot of the digitized stuff that already exists and see it in a new way. And so that's what we've been doing at the University of Richmond. I decided I never want to build the Valley of the Shadow again, and I don't think anybody else does either. It's good we have one of them, but there are other ways that we can do all this. So what I thought would, the most efficient way I've found to convey large amounts of information to large numbers of people are through maps. And so what we made At Richmond, we created the Digital Scholarship Lab, and we've had a whole series of projects, the biggest one of which is American Panorama, and it's a digital atlas of American history. And the, um, I'll click on it here, and there's not been uh, a, an atlas of American history since 1933 based on original research. And we digitized it, we, we got uh, the permission from the Carnegie Institute that produced it. And we were working through it and we discovered that they had this line in it. So they worked on this since 1903 till 1933. And they said, you know, representing historical change on the pages of a book doesn't really work. You know, arrows and things like that don't really work. He said, the ideal historical atlas would be a series of moving images on the pages of a book without the machinery of a projector and screen. <laughs> so just as Vannevar Bush had seen hypertext in 1945, in 1933, the makers of the historical geography of the United States had foreseen the iPad. 
that we're able to have all of those things. And so uh, this is uh, mapping uh, inequality, uh, which is redlining in, in all the uh, cities of the United States. And it, it, um, Le uh, Lexington is one of them. I'm not going to call it here. But we also do things like this. And this is all based on pre-existing data in the United States Census. And the idea here is, wouldn't it be great if we could show the foreign-born population of every county in the United States from 1850 to 2010? And you can click on any one of these counties, and it sends these tendrils out to where the people there migrated from in every census year. But you'll see the other thing that it's doing along the way, up at the top, it shows that this is uh, Virginia in 2010, uh, and it says that uh, in this Russell County, Belarus is the main origins of where these people are from. Uh, let's see if I can get, get a Kentucky one. Fleming, Kentucky, people are mainly from Guatemala and the Netherlands. Who had that answer before I did that, right? <laughs> but you can see how population is changing over time. And you can see that it takes you down into the county. And my dream here is that every middle school girl in America could see that she's a part of American history. No matter where she's from, where she lives, we're part of this fabric of this country. And we can all see that we're a nation of immigrants. And we always have been. The other thing that... Okay, go ahead. Let's allow. Go ahead. Allow once. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so it's going to take us into Lexington. And you'll see it lay down the map from the 1930s, and it automatically generates all of this. And it's showing this is when redlining, in which uh, racially exclusive uh, laws from the federal government were put into place. Um, and so we have this for 150 cities. And in one week, we got rave reviews from dissent and from Fortune magazine in the same week. Uh, they're both like this. The idea here is to empower people wherever they live. Here's your own city. Here's your own history. Look at the neighborhoods today. Why are they there? Why do they look the way they do? We have a new project coming out now called um, uh, Urban Renewal. It turns out that most of the cities in America that had urban renewal were 25,000 people or less. And we're going to make it possible to go into every city in the United States and track the history of urban renewal. But we also have made this map of the forced migration of African American people in the United States and had to find new ways of, of representing this. It's taking a while for, for it to load. Uh, and the, the, in the same way, it uses multiple forms of representation, which will come up here soon. Red areas are where the African-American population is growing because they were either taken there or sold there. And areas where it's blue is where they were being taken from. And this brings up with a degree of specificity that we've never been able to see before. For some reason, it's not completely coming up. But you click on here, and it's going to set up the narratives of people who actually experienced that. Their words of what it was like to be sold in Virginia and taken to Arkansas, Louisiana, okay? And so in all these ways, we're seeing things that we've never been able to see before. We're not making a map to illustrate something that we already knew, but rather it's all about discovery. Let's just put the entire forced migration population on there and see what the patterns might be. You can see you can turn on cotton. It's, everything is, I don't know if I've overloaded the, the network here or whatever, but it gives you an idea of what we're doing. So, in all these kind of ways, we're trying to show what might, you might be able to do with maps. Uh, one of our participants here today, Ann Rubin, is doing it a different way with her wonderful project on Sherman's March, actually using this to make an argument. So there's the march, and then here's a civilian experience. The network's really slowing down here. Tourism, it's not actually working. Uh, you can get the idea of what way that is working as well. Here's the thing. Now we all carry around dynamic atlases in our pockets and our smartphones. I think geography and integrating all these different things, we've made a project here on the Overland Trail that's based entirely on diaries. We can show you exactly what the path was on the Overland Trail. We've, we've mapped the entire 
history of canals in America and what every one of them carried in every year. It's the same spirit. Here is American history in a way that you have not thought of it before. We have the entire record of American history to see in new ways. We can see patterns that we could not see before just reading one letter at a time. Being able to see the entire census and being able to see it for 150 years is an exciting new prospect that we have. But how do we write history about that? Now, there's another possibility that's emerged in the last decade that is embodied in the Civil War Governor's Paper Project, which is open source software that lets us build things quickly. So this is a project that my freshman class at the University of Richmond built this spring. And it is 2,000 articles from the Richmond Dispatch of during the era of Reconstruction. And the young people who built this were 19 years old and have, the network's really working to try to bring this up. Um, here we go, here we go, it's coming. Um, and came up with a whole typology of how you would, it's kind of grayed out, but what it says is over on the left are federal relations, race, uh, Confederate memory, state politics, economic development, black advancement, and national politics, which are the categories they decided after transcribing all these articles. But here's the thing. It begins, the Library of Congress and, and the NEH have digitized over 2,000 American newspapers, and they're online. But the machinery right now isn't good enough to really do them justice. It kind of does optical character recognition. Sometimes the article's pretty accurate. Other times it's gibberish. Okay? So our students went in to the Virginia version of that, corrected the article, and then put all this information around them so that now people can... Some, tell me somebody, something from Reconstruction you're curious about. Oh, uh, let's say Andrew Johnson. And there are the 200 articles, as it turns out, about have Andrew Johnson in them, and you click on there, and there's the article and the transcription and a summary. Uh, Anne and Amy, who worked on this, will recognize these are things that took us a bazillion years to do uh, in the Valley of the Shadow, and now we have 16 freshmen able to do it in three months. And it's based on open source, the same open source that your project is based on. And so for no money, other than the expertise of somebody in the library whose job it is to make this and who's delighted to do so, we were able to make something that now takes something that had been completely locked away and with one semester's work shares it. That is another tributary of open source software taking advantage of really millions and millions of dollars worth of investment in digitizing things if we just harvest it. Every vote ever taken in America, everything we know about from all the manuscript census has now been digitized. What we need now is the imagination to take advantage of that, to be able to see it in new ways. Now, the newest project I'm working on is so new that it wouldn't let me see the prototype that we've built. But I've, through the magic of language, I will evoke it for you. It's, it's called Bunk, which is from the Henry Ford quote that history is more or less bunk. And of course, we know it's not, but we know many people think it is, so wouldn't it be fun just to play with that idea? What it is, it's going to be harvesting every day all the representations of the American past and all media. So if there's a cool blog entry in something that's relatively obscure, it's there, but if it's also in the Atlantic or the New York or the New York Times or the Washington Post, it'll be there. Also, if there's a cool podcast or if there's something uh, made available from something like the Kentucky Historical Society, but online resource, we're constantly harvesting all of this. And we've designed this software, which this will be out really in just very soon. It, it works now. If you can imagine that there's what we call the bunk core, uh, students at the University of Richmond who even this today, I'm sure, being paid and working on this, the, all this elaborate tagging that wraps each of these objects in sort of a series of tags that lets them connect in multiple ways with other things in real time. So people are saying, whoa, James Comey's testifying uh, before the Senate today. 
how, what's the historical context for that? And you'll click on that, and it will take you to other times that people have testified before Congress. It will take you link into uh, other stories about the FBI, other times that presidents have differed with uh, uh, with Congress, and that will all be made all the time, every day. You notice what that is? It's going back to that original epiphany in front of the microfilm reader, is that history is between the lines. History is not defined by genres. History is not defined by the medium in which it comes out. History is not bounded by the moment that it's written. But it, we're able to harvest all of this great work for, a, for as long as we can do it that allows it to talk to each other. And what's the goal? Is to make history as cool as STEM. Right? <laughs> and which is it, it, and it is. Anyway, but people don't know it because we've not used exciting new means of representation. This bunk grew out of me teaching a class that you are called Touching the Past. And the real question, which I didn't share with the students, is what do 18-year-olds think American history is? And so we would have many conversations. And I saw immediately, if it's not online, it doesn't exist. I asked one of them one time, I, I, a class, I said, hey, what's a monograph? And these are kids who've gone to very fine schools, and they kind of look at the floor, and one brave student says, Dr. Ayers, does it have anything to do with monotonous? <laughs> and I said, well, not really. It does have mono in it, but it's, they're awesome. We're going to read some that are exciting. But the fact that a kid go all the way through high school and not have any idea of where new historical knowledge comes from, you know what they know what a Bunsen burner is, right? They know what a lab is but they have no idea how in the world we learn new things about the past or how we determine if some statements about the past are true and others are not. They have no idea. And so if we can give them a place where they can actually watch every day as Americans, not even thinking about it, every new episode of Mad Men, you know, is a historical representation. It's interpreting the past. How does that connect to these other kinds of things? And the final version of, of digital history that I want to mention to you is something I saw, it actually turns out it's not the final, but, but it's another one, is that museums, there's a power of place that is undeniable. And coming to a place, and there's a power in actual things. And what we can do with the amplification of digital media with that is remarkable as well. So, Digital media doesn't just mean to be something on a screen. What it really means is that we're taking advantage of the powers suddenly that we possess to show things in multiple dimensions, to make them more powerful, to make them not less. And of course, just because something is di begins as digital doesn't mean it needs to stay that way. So this is our, what was our radio show backstory, which, uh, where we rip a headline out of the newspapers and explore its history every week. I'm not doing it this week because I'm here with you instead. It's okay to have a break. Uh, but we decided last year that even though we were on over 200 NPR stations, that we were going to walk away from them and become podcast. Because podcast can be, A, they're free, but B, they can go anywhere. You don't have to be in your car at 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon to hear. It's like a DVR. And we're finding that our listenership is going way up and becoming much more diverse because people can listen to it whenever they want to. So it's digital. We're making digital recordings. We still talk about cutting tape and so forth, and, but it's not. It's all digital. And it's transmitted through digital means to your iPhone and then listen to it in your car or on your headphones. But it goes back to the oldest form of history there is, of one person talking, trying to explain how the heck we got here. And so this idea that the digital must displace what we love about history is a mistake. The digital can enable all the things that we love about it, democratize it, share it, energize it, and I feel like today that we saw what the future looks like. Make a project that takes advantage of the wonderful resources you already possess, and then bring people together to share with each other, experts in this case, what they have seen there. And then write essays about how everybody is seeing something different. But it's all true. 
because it's all in the archive. So it's been and still is a kind of uh, breathtaking journey. But the point is, is that this is the m most profound social change of our time. It would be a shame if we didn't try to take advantage of it. And I'm proud to be here at a place that is. So you can't possibly have believed all that. So now let's hear what questions and challenges you have about any of those things. Who has a question? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. You can't raise your hand if you're applauding. So, all right. Who's going first? Somebody will, and they'll get 5,000 bonus points uh, <laughs> when they do. Yeah, all right, good. Um, so this works really well, it seems like, for United States history, where everyone speaks English. Yep. But um, it seems like with modern trends in history going towards an international reach, yep. this might have limitations, or does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, our books are written in one language, right? So do they have limitations of being monolingual? Yes. Uh, but so do most of the other forms in which we transmit things. The beauty of this is that A, there's auto, there is electronic translation that can turn these things around, but it's also the case that we can, uh, a lot, other countries are doing obviously the, the same things for themselves, and there's a lot of cross-pollination. I don't know the United States were a particular leader, the UK has done a lot of great work for a long time. Um, I guess I just don't worry about that very much. We've got you know, so much work before us that we could do it. I would say this, we know that about 20% of our audience for backstory is international. Now, obviously they speak English, or at least my southern version of it, but uh, <laughs> so that they're, you know, it, it's not necessarily limiting. But yes, one virtue of hypertext, if we did it right, would be that it would be in multiple languages. That would be for some younger person to tackle. <laughs> but it's a great point, though. What else we got? You got there's still some bonus points left over. Yes? We had the session this afternoon with the students, and it was you know, trying to make the, the Civil War Governors Kentucky site so look much easier to use and make it better for undergraduates and make it more user friendly and, and you know, proper tagging and all that. My concern is, and it was somebody, I, I forget who brought it up, but are we losing the kind of the sense of the old sense of the arc of the browse of you know the serendipity of the things that you're not looking for that we make it too easy and we tag everything that that's as far as people will go i mean my my, my i love ancestry.com i looked at microfilm census you know yeah wrote it out in notebooks it's still very hard to browse it and you have to kind of work hard to, to kind and of not really made for browsing yeah are, are the confederate records as well in full yeah, three that's right so how do we kind of keep that old thing of the, the, the serendipity of finding something you weren't looking for? Yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting because so the, the 19 year olds who helped us make this, I just walked in there and said, here's how I want, we got these newspapers, what should we do with them, right? And here's one of the, so one of the things you can see, you can browse all 1,862 articles that we did by date, okay? So you can browse them in a way that you could not on the newspaper, uh, but you can also do this. Um, And this is completely a student's idea. Random articles. Every time you turn it on, it brings up a different subset of articles. And they were doing for exactly the same reason that you're talking about students today. I don't know where to start. I don't know anything about Reconstruction in Virginia. I mean, nobody does, as it turns out, very much. But uh, uh, and how would I start? So we gave various entree points into it for just that reason. Because if you're just presented with a search button, you have no idea what to search for. So we have the random. You saw browse articles by date. We have, uh, well, key people. It's moving around on me. Uh, or key topics. So you might not have any idea who Benjamin Butler is, but you might be 18 and curious and it's alliterative. And, and these are people that, that we went through. We knew that there's a significant amount of, of traffic. And of course, this is just a random word generator that, uh, not random word generator, it's a, a cloud that shows the actual percentage 
of the words that were used. And so my students who'd read all these papers were really surprised that people was the most common word. And now you can see it. So for just the reason that you're saying, my students, I, I said, Here's, you're making this for yourself two years ago. When you were trapped in some high school and they're talking to you about reconstruction, and reconstruction usually happens over the winter break or between volume one and two, and it's kind of a bummer, and there's n nobody wins, and so forth. And if you, we, start, we began by looking online. What do we know about Reconstruction? And they came back and said, well, the one thing that everybody agrees on is a failure. And I said, is that an inspiring way to uh, think about triggering interest in this subject? No. So how could we do it? And the point would be we give many points of entry. And it's just exactly the students with your experience. Of, and so searching is relatively low on the list of ways that you would do this. We're all about browsing in lots of different ways. But when you are ready to search, we got it. We give you 100% satisfaction on the search that you conduct. <laughs> that, you know, one of the things that, you know, something I've not talked about as much of the projects that we did is, um, let's see, it's not as clearly, is, um, we make projects for specific historic times. And so we were, had the 150th anniversary, and this is pretty cool, and I had nothing to do with this. Let me close this, I think that's the problem. Uh, look at this. My, my colleague Rob Nelson made this, uh, also growing out of a freshman class, and when it appears, it's gonna show you all presidential travels in all of American history from in a way you've never seen it before. And you can see all the charts around the edges about the, the amounts of it. You can see Clinton and Obama, how much, and it shows you where they go and all this. These were made out of published records that were there that are otherwise useless. This is a form of browsing, right? It's exploratory. I have no idea of what to ask about presidential travels. I know that President Trump just went to Saudi Arabia. Have other people gone to Saudi Arabia? That's kind of the idea behind bunk, too. Whatever you got will give you some kind of satisfactory return on your investment of time and energy to come into it. Because serendipity, as I saw on that scratchy microfilm in the library, uh, is the mother of uh, curiosity and history. What else we got? Anybody from this side? Yes, thank you. How do you decide which newspapers and which sources to go to and which ones to eliminate? You obviously can't do all of them. Yeah, so which newspapers originally to choose? So here's the thing. So the student said, okay, you're responsible for four and a half months of this daily newspaper in Richmond, okay? You go out and read your first week. You describe to me what you find. We come, we come back in like we've been doing today. We collaborate. What are we finding? What deserves to be included? Do we, rec do we include every police report? No, we don't. That's not, the, okay? How much national politics? So we do it through a collaborative. It's trial and error. Uh, I chose the Richmond Times Dispatch because it's a daily newspaper that's charting every day how this incredible experiment and how, what do you replace slavery with, okay? And how do you create new forms of citizenship and write entirely new constitutions? And how do African American people navigate this? How do we read between the lines of a white newspaper to get at the African American experience? So it's the question that makes the class worth doing. But they were so motivated by this. This is gonna be an installation in the Black History Museum in Richmond. And so we went there one night and had a demo for people who were there for a, a showing. And they would come in. And they came, the students came to class the next day. And they said, people thought we were graduate students. <laughs> and he said, no, we're 19. <laughs> <laughs> but they, the idea that they've signed each of these articles as their handiwork is critical. Now, I asked them at one point, said, do you want your names associated in this on the metadata? Yes. <laughs> and so I think they work so much harder than they would have if just writing a paper. If I give a B plus, who cares? But if their friends know that they're doing this and has their name on it, and then it, it increases that. So I think the part of this is that you have to relinquish the authority that comes from being the only person in the room who has done the thing that we're doing, right? Kids, I don't know how to do a Mecca either. Our friend Chris here does, and he, he's come here to talk to us. What do we want to have on there? Hey, how about a random article generator? Chris, can you do that? Yeah. 
okay, we've got that. And so that they are as much expert, now they, they're not nearly as expert as they think because they're just consumers of all this stuff. They think that they're sophisticated, but they're not. They know about as much about digital stuff as I know about watching cable television. I don't know where it comes from, right? It's, but they think that they're cool and this is really good for self-awareness for them to discover how complicated this really is and to recognize everything they're reading is being judged by other people and put there for a reason, right? So it's, you kind of have, with all of this, you have to accept the process as a part of the result, right? So do we have, I, I'm not in charge. I will answer questions or comments. I'm curious that some people who are as old as I am say, uh, does this feel to you that we're losing things by doing this? Are we um, missing out of some of the excitement that drew, drew you to history in the first place? If the answer is yes, I'll deflect it onto somebody else. So it's okay. You go ahead and say it if you like. Do we worry about losing a generation who doesn't really have a smartphone and feels like maybe we're losing the soul of history, that you fell in love with history through Bruce Catton or something and we're taking this away? Does anybody think that? I just didn't really mean that. Yes. Well, I don't know that I think that. I think it's fascinating, but like I remember one time I got to go look through. It's not coming to you. Oh, I remember one time. I don't. I think it's fascinating. Well, that's all the time we have then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got to go look through all of Amelia Earhart's telegrams, the last one she sent, and the ones her husband and and the hand-colored maps and that tactile. Yes. That, I mean, it, there better. might be ways to do that, though, but you could open a telegram, maybe, or... Yeah, I mean, you could do things like that. There's, the fact is, we will always need places like the Kentucky Historical Society because the real thing is better I than it. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they have people like me come in and say, no. <laughs> no, because we, we always need the real. But the thing is, people don't know the real exists until they see these versions of it, right? So with all the newspapers, you can go back and see the original newspaper. And you go, okay, that's what it looked like, and here's what was not included. And here are the, what the, the structure of it looks like. So the, the thing is, is that, and this is my final comment, the digital is, does not negate or displace or trivialize what we've had before. It shares it more widely. It makes us understand where the books we love come from. It makes us imagine that we could write new kinds of books, that we can see history in new kinds of ways. And I think that's the most exciting thing that I can imagine being involved in, and that's why we've been involved in these days, and I appreciate being a part of it. Thank you very much.